March meeting. And uh, I would like to ask for all of our guests online, if you would get in the chat and tell us, we like to keep track of how you hear about our programs. If you could put in the chat how you learned about this program and maybe give, even give us a little review of it when you, after, after we finish. So anyway, <laughs> thank you. Oh, it will all be good, I'm sure. <laughs> I have enjoyed working with Bob and Karen on the, uh, the pollinator presentations that we recently did, um, getting to know them. We, we had a presentation on Tuesday and presented, uh, Tuesday was Pi Day, if you remember, 314, and several of us um, gave different slices of the pollinator pie perspective. So it was a real, very enjoyable evening that Bob and Karen participated in. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Bob Thorpe um, taught art and archaeology of China and sometimes Japan for 25 years at Princeton and at Washington University in St. Louis. He also lectured for tour groups in China and Japan for 15 years as a second career. He co-authored Chinese Art and Culture, a textbook bestseller in China, and has written catalogs and guidebooks. His presentation is an introduction to the classic gardens of China and Japan, their history, design principles, and vocabulary, and the aesthetic and philosophical values that inform them. He will examine several scholar gardens in Suzhou and temple gardens in Kyoto as case studies. So please welcome Bob Thorpe for our March presentation. Thank you. Following me. So we're going to go. Uh, for those of you online, we're having difficulty getting the chat um, to work. We've got our computers mixed up. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, but hopefully, you are still hearing us. Yes, I will. Well, thank you to the cast of thousands that have introduced me now. And thank you all for sticking around for this presentation. It's my pleasure to be here and to uh, talk to you today. This is a talk about the craft of gardens in China and Japan. I'm just going to try to move this. this yes, thing if out. you can disappear that, I'd be happy. Oh, uh, no. How do I disappear that? Come on. Control Alt Shift H. Okay, thank you. Control Alt Shift. Now, if you could push the H, I've got all my fingers. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is a talk about the, I'd like to go back to the first slide if I could. Push the number one and enter. No, we're still in the uh, room. We have to click on the, the PowerPoint and do the same. That's not, he wants the best. Go back to the first. Oh, oh. Why don't you just use the arrows? I don't want to jump to I don't know why that's not working. Click on the, the screen so it's in power. But it may be in Zoom. Click on the screen? So that you're in the PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Yay, thank Yay. you. <laughs> this is a presentation about the craft of gardens in China and Japan not a talk about gardening in China and Japan. And I think that distinction will become clear as I keep on talking. What we're talking about today really is a kind of landscape architecture in China and Japan. And I'll have precious little to say about plants and pots and things like that. I've been studying China since I was a recent college graduate 
and was taught, uh, taught Chinese by the US Air Force so I could go off to Taiwan and intercept radio communications. Um, and that training in Chinese language changed my life. And I will always be grateful for Uncle Sam for doing that to me, even though I was trying to beat the draft. I went on to graduate school and then to a career in teaching. And I was active as a teacher until about 2001, and then active taking tours to China for a while after that. But really, if you stop and think about it, what I really did for my professional career of about 50 years now uh, can be divided into three buckets or three categories. I spent a lot of time in that time period working on exhibitions from China. Uh, that began for me in February of 1979, which is just after Jimmy Carter normalized relations with the PRC. And I was spending the month of February 1979 in Beijing doing photography for the Great Bronze Age of China exhibition, which you see there on the left-hand screen. In the 1980s, I was able to curate an exhibition from China that raised money for the Chinese Welfare Fund for the Handicapped. That was in Seattle and Columbus, Ohio. Seen by over a million people, we raised about half a million dollars for the Welfare Fund for the Handicapped. So a lot of my travel to China initially was being involved in exhibitions. I also got involved in archeology span because I was trained to be an archeologist. It's just that I was trained at a time when you couldn't go to China and do archeology, span small problem. But gradually over time, the China did open up. I had a chance to go to uh, the mainland and to take part in some archeological projects. That started as early as 1980, when Karen, my life partner, and I toured around China for 80 days visiting archeologists and their, their projects. And added to that, the tours that I did after I retired up until about 2016, mean that I've been to China about 50 times now, uh, sometimes for extended periods. I've seen, I think, 18 of the 30 some provinces of China. And of course, because I was a scholar and I had to prove that I was a scholar, I've been publishing. Um, Nancy mentioned that I have a book called Chinese Art and Culture, which is a bestseller in China. And in fact, that's true. Uh, Rick Vinograd from Stanford and I wrote a textbook back in 2001, published here in America. It went out of print by 2009. But the translation in China has been a bestseller, and I'm actually making real money on it. So let's talk about the craft of gardens. The first time that people in our part of the world, the so-called Western world, Europe and the Mediterranean world, first time those people heard about gardens in China was our friend Marco Polo. Marco Polo was a real historical person. His book, which is usually called The Travels, uh, or the description of the world is full of fantastic, incredible stuff, which you should not believe. But it is also built on a substratum of actual information about China when China was controlled by the Mongols. And Marco and his family went to China and actually was in Beijing, which at the time was called Kambaluk, the Khan's great city. And he has left us a description of some of the features of the Khan's great city, including its gardens. That's really the first the world of the West knew of the thing called gardens in China. There's then a tremendous gap in knowledge of China and Japan, of course, until after the age of discovery. And it really begins in the 18th century. Jesuit missionaries in China, and of course the uh, Commodore Perry's uh, mission to Japan brought firsthand knowledge of China and Japan too. Europe and the Americas. So there's really a tremendous gap in terms of the literature about China and Japan, and especially the gardens of those two countries until fairly recent times, in the case of Japan, the 19th century, in the case of China, the 18th century. And that knowledge led to a number of phenomena you're probably at least vaguely aware of, the chinoiserie that dominated European decorative arts for a time, and a similar movement called Japonisme, which is the adoption of Japanese motifs in Western art and architecture. And of course, we shouldn't forget the China trade of the 19th century, which developed, and which I'm pretty sure brought some of the first plants from East Asia to these shores, plants we sometimes curse today. Last but not least, in the late 19th century and early in the 20th century, both China and Japan were represented at world expositions or fairs, for example, St. Louis, 1904. There were extensive properties in the St. Louis Fairgrounds, which is now Forest Park, uh, 
both for China, you see that on the left, and Japan, you can see that on the right. Um, they, of course, do not survive. The park has taken over. So there's a gradual process by which people in Europe and the Americas start to learn about the gardens of Japan, start to absorb some of the ideas that were then understood about those gardens. And we're now living in the, in the after effect of that. Let's be clear, China, Zhongguo, is that bulging mass of the East Asian or the Eurasian continent uh, that sticks out in the Pacific. Uh, China is today a huge country. The People's Republic of China is a huge country, but traditional China, pre-modern traditional China, usually was much smaller than that. It's really not even all that you can see on my map on the left-hand screen. Uh, this is an area what, uh, which scholars call China proper. Uh, but even so, that much smaller area that belonged to most of the Chinese imperial dynasties uh, was a very diverse environment. Uh, it's a continental climate, uh, harsh, cold winters, tremendous thunderstorms in the north in the summertime in August, for example, when most of the rain falls, but a great diversity of topography in China proper. And that, of course, affects the ways in which people in China think about gardens and the kind of plants and such that are available for the gardens. Specifically, there is a part of China around modern-day Shanghai called Jiangnan, Jiangnan, which means south of the river. The river here is the Yangtze, or as I learned to call it when I was growing up, the Yangtze. So south of the Yangtze River is Jiangnan, and that is the specific source for most of the evocations of landscape you find in Chinese gardens of the pre-modern period. It incorporates such mountains as the Yellow Mountains, the Huangshan you see on the left, or such scenic views as West Lake outside of Hangzhou, which you can see on the right. In any case, this is South China, or Central and South China. A much milder climate than the North, much more rainfall, much more vegetation, including semi-tropical and tropical vegetation, a very different array of uh, natural elements to work with compared to, let us say, a garden art that developed in North China around Beijing. Japan, Nihon, is of course an archipelago. It's an archipelago off of the Eurasian continent, separated by the Sea of Japan from the mainland. Four major islands, which are most of the territory, but hundreds, even thousands of other smaller ones. Uh, as far as we're concerned, it's the four major islands, and in particular Honshu, the main island that we're talking about. This is the area occupied by Tokyo and Kyoto and Osaka and so forth. Very different topography from mainland China, very different climate from mainland China. Uh, there are volcanoes active in Japan, of course. Uh, most of Japan is mountainous. There are very few flat areas. Forests used to predominate on the Japanese islands. Uh, you're looking at an active volcano near Kagoshima on the left-hand screen, taken from my hotel room, um, or a village in the mountains in the case of the right. So these are both Asian, civilizations, the continental Chinese one, the archipelago of the Japanese islands and the other, uh, sharing many of the same plants and animals, of course, because of that connection, but also quite different. Now, the story of gardens in China, and really Japan too, begins with imperial gardens. And if you believe the literary record, there have been imperial gardens and royal gardens going back into the Bronze Age in China. The oldest physical evidence that I know of is an archaeological site in modern-day Canton. It's called the Garden of the, the Prince or the King of Nanyue, Nanyue. And there's an artist's reconstruction of what it might have looked like uh, when it was in its glory. It, this is an actual archaeological site that has been dug and reported. And you can see in those reports the pathways and the water features and the foundations of buildings that were a part of that royal or princely garden in modern-day Canton. We're talking now about the second and first centuries BC. So we know there was an evolved garden design art as long ago as the second and first centuries BC in China, in the Chinese mainland. Today, the oldest imperial or royal gardens that we have actually are very, very late in Chinese history. So for example, the Yuhuayuan or the flower garden at the rear of the Forbidden City is one of the very few surviving imperial gardens uh, from pre-modern China. 
And it is, as you can see in the diagram on the right, a very formal garden, much more a formal garden than anything I'm going to show you for the rest of this presentation. Uh, you're looking at a plot of the central axis with a main hall toward the top of that axis and plots of land and, and pots for planting and various pavilions and what have you symmetrically disposed on both sides of that central axis. This is not typical of most of the classic gardens of China, but it is often the case for imperial gardens, especially those in a confined area like the Forbidden City. But this garden would be as late as the 18th century in terms of its features that you see and experience today. Here are a couple of snapshots of the imperial flower garden. You're looking at a pavilion on the right-hand screen and a residential building on the left in the center screen with a rock formation in front. And our friend, the last emperor of China, Hu Yi, there in the black and white photograph with his tutor, Reginald Johnson, snapshot taken in the Imperial Flower Garden at the rear end of Forbidden City back in the 19-teens and 20s. The palace had gardens within the palace walls, but it's important to understand that the emperors of China, especially in the late dynasties, the Ming and the Qing, had much more at their disposal than just those gardens that were appended to the halls of the palace inside the walls of the moat. They had huge imperial parks and garden properties scattered all around the imperial capital of Beijing. You may be familiar with Beihai, which is very close to the Forbidden City in downtown Beijing, that's on the right, or perhaps the Summer Palace, which is in the northwest suburbs of Beijing. These are two very important tourist sites today. The Imperial House, especially the Qing or Manchu Imperial House, had hundreds and even thousands of acres of park and garden property that they had access to for various purposes, in addition to those gardens that were built inside the Forbidden City. The origin of gardens, of Imperial Gardens in particular, is the concept of a menagerie or a zoo and a kind of botanical garden. In other words, from very early times, continuing down to and including the Manchus of the Qing Dynasty, Rulers, kings, and emperors would collect rare animals and keep them in different parts of their park or garden. And they would collect rare specimens of botany as well and grow th those specimens, of course. So the notion that an imperial person or a royal person had a garden was in part a, a matter of showing their command of the world and of the universe because they had the plants and the animals of the entire world at their fingertips disposed in their park or their garden. Uh, as a part of their, their status as the ruler of the world. Now, the classic gardens of China that derive from the imperial gardens are a very different creature altogether. One of the things you have to understand about gardens in China is the importance of the concept of landscape. Landscape, believe it or not, is not a natural concept. It doesn't exist in all cultures. It has to be invented in European languages. It refers literally to the shape or the sculpting of the land, uh, but there was an analogous development in China, the development of Shan Shui, Shan Shui, mountains and waters, mountains and waters. That's the modern term and the pre-modern term too for landscape. They're developed in China after the first imperial dynasties an appreciation for the splendors of landscape. The natural world wasn't just a scary place full of animals that could eat you. The natural world was a place where you could go and renew your soul. The natural world was a place where you could go and be inspired and have an aesthetic experience. This is not to be taken for granted. For very many pre-modern cultures, the natural world is a bit horrific, at least scary, uh, but not in China. In China, there was an appreciation of landscape for its aesthetic value. And that appreciation of landscape underlies later Chinese poetry. It underlies later Chinese painting. And of course, it's the basis for the design of gardens. Now, the most common idea associated with landscape in China is the idea of macrocosm and microcosm. The idea that you could see the larger cosmos in a small fraction of it. So for example, a small garden could represent the splendors of the entire natural world. The microcosm, the garden, representing the macrocosm, the entire natural world. I'm showing you here a picture of one of the holy mountains of North China. It's Hengshan, which is a wonderful rocky flinty mountain in northwestern China, north and west of Beijing on the left. And I'm also showing a, a ink landscape painting in the Nelson Gallery in Kansas City by an artist named Xu Daoning, 
And I have to say, if you've never seen this painting by Xu Daoming, I would like you to stop right now, get in your car, and drive to the Nelson Gallery. Because it's worth it. It's a painting you must see and you must study. And if you haven't yet, at your advanced age, what's wrong with you? The Nelson, in fact, is a wonderful collection of Chinese art, including landscape painting, including that of the Song Dynasty, which is the great age of that. And that's Xu Daoming right there. So the creation of garden designs, landscape architecture we call gardens, really is grounded in the ideas that developed about the appreciation of landscape as a subject for poetry, as a subject for painting, as a subject for three-dimensional representation as a part of your living experience. Another set of ideas that imbues garden design and also the experience of the garden is the notion of seasonality or of the four seasons, the siji, now, the four seasons in China are based on a solar lunar calendar. It's not the same 12 months that you and I know as January to December. So the solar lunar calendar means there are always 12 months in the year, but occasionally there's a little extra time thrown in for good measure to keep things in balance. It also means that months numbers one, two, and three are spring officially, whatever the weather is, and months four, five, and six are summer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So some of the things we associate with spring or winter may not quite correlate with your idea of the 10th month of the year or the second month of the year as the case may be. But gardens were meant in part to be places where you experienced the splendors of the season. For example, the chrysanthemums blooming there in the garden on the middle screen. And we have a painting here of a Chinese emperor, Qianlong by name on the left-hand screen, experiencing the first dusting of snow in his imperial garden. There are a whole series of, of uh, festivals that are, appear in the Chinese solar lunar calendar, which could be enjoyed, celebrated, commemorated in a garden setting. But more than that, there are a number of plants that are crucial to a garden design that carry meaning. Plants that have been attributed to or associated with various human virtues. So for example, the bamboo. The bamboo, which of course is native to continental Asia, early on became a subject matter for Chinese painting. And a Chinese scholar painter might do a work like Li Kan in the left-hand screen, which is also, by the way, in the Nelson Gallery. You don't have to put down everything now and go see it, but it's also worth seeing. And of course, the, the classic story of the origin of painting bamboo is that it was based on seeing bamboo in a garden and the reflections from the sun or the moon, take your pick, against a white wall. And there's a photograph of actual bamboo from a garden in Sujo right there. The bamboo is esteemed because it is always green. Okay. It bends with the wind and with other forces, but it doesn't break. It's extremely useful and versatile in terms of utility. And all those things make it a kind of paradigm of a gentleman, a Chinese scholar gentleman, who is always green well, always useful anyway, and who bends but doesn't break, who in other words holds on to his principles and doesn't give them up for expedi expeditious reasons. Anyway, expedient reasons. Anyway, so some of the plants that are used in garden design also have a variety of, of symbolic associations and associations with virtue, so forth. Likewise, another component you will find in garden designs are allusions to what is referred to in Chinese as the Isles or the Islands of the Immortals. The Isles of the Immortals. Xianren, these are beings who look like human beings, but in fact live forever. They somehow have achieved a magical transcendent state. Uh, they hang out on mountaintops. They sustain themselves on dew. Uh, to become an immortal became an important goal of Taoists in ancient China, and allusions to stories about immortals, like where they hung out and so forth, were incorporated early on into garden design. I'm showing you a painting on the left of a woman who's about to be transported to the land of the immortals, and I'm showing you a detail from the Imperial Flower Garden on the right of a pile of rocks, which is meant to be something like the island of the immortals in the sea in the ocean, in the Eastern Ocean. And there's a pavilion up there where you can go and enjoy the moon, the full moon. I've already mentioned the word Taoism. Taoism is truly a can of worms. 
I can do a semester and talk about Taoism and not get through all the necessary topics. Taoism, in many respects, is a philosophical orientation. It's an orientation that has to do with how human beings relate to the natural environment. It is very much at the root of a lot of ideas about man in nature or humankind in nature in China and Japan, for that matter. But it also, over time, became a kind of religious practice, as well as a philosophical orientation. And there was actually a Taoist church in China. In fact, there still is a Taoist church in China. And because it's associated with nature, Taoism informs the way people think about gardens, too. Uh, you're all familiar with the terms yin and yang, or as my friends used to say, yin yang. Yin, Y-I-N, for dark and shady, and yang for bright and sunny, yin and yang. That's a Taoist concept. But it's not a concept of duality. It's a concept of complementarity. And if you know the yin-yang symbol, you know that it's a kind of S shape on a circle. One blending into the other, and then that blending to the first again. Yin and yang. So male and female are not a duality. They're a complementary continuity. I think that's very appropriate today in any place like uh, Kansas, where the governor just turned down a bill to discriminate against people who are not fitting certain categories. Okay, so Taoist ideas do penetrate into garden design. But perhaps the most fundamental thing I can say as a way of an introduction to these topics is that gardens are an appurtenance of how you live. Gardens are built into and tacked onto the place you live. And the fundamental design for that in China is the four-sided courtyard, the Sihuyuar, the four-sided courtyard. The diagram makes it pretty clear, I think, and I don't think it's an eye, type, eye chart test, Kevin. You can see that there are walls delimiting the plot. You can see that there are rooms inside the walls facing on a central open area, which is the courtyard. And that's what it's all about. It's about having buildings inside a wall that face inward at right angles to one another with a square central courtyard area at the center to collect sunshine, of course. Um, this is a design that is ubiquitous or was ubiquitous in Beijing in the Ming and Qing dynasties. It, in fact, it was a standardized design under that, those two dynasties, but it's common throughout all of continental China, north and south. And it means that people live within walls, but they have access to the natural world via plantings and pots and gardens. Here are two really fancy examples of Sihe Yuar, one in the northwest in Shanxi on the left, and another in the south, not that far from West Lake, actually, in Hangzhou on the uh, right. Garden features, whether they are fully engaged with the landscape or simply in a pot, are a part of all courtyard houses in China in pre-modern times. People lived with plantings and small gardens in their walled compounds where they resided cut off from the rest of the world, but still in touch with the natural world. Who are these people? Well, I can say without exception that these were all men. They were all scholar officials or equally wealthy members of the merchant class. Literatis, we call them, literati. People who were trained in the traditional learning of China, who took the scholar examinations, who passed, who received official appointments and performed government jobs. These are the literati scholar officials of pre-modern China, called in Chinese wenrin, wenrin, which means cultivated people, basically. And I show you here a wenrin, a literatus, a scholar official perhaps, in his garden in a painting that's now in Taiwan. Bear in mind that the literati scholar officials had income and they had other sources of wealth as well, they were the elite of pre-modern China. There were merchants who didn't go that route, and they were wealthy too, but it's the scholar officials who account for most of the patronage of gardens in pre-modern China. And it's mostly about improving their family properties, and it's mostly about what they do when they retire from official life and create a world for themselves to live inside their own walls. Scholar official careers weren't terribly long lasting, as it turns out. It can be dangerous to be a scholar official, or for whatever reason, people will decide simply to retire early, sort of like I did. When you do that in pre-modern China, you retire to your native place, to your own property, you have money, and you build a garden. 
And remember I said, build a garden. That's the concept in China. You don't plant it, you don't till it and trim it, you don't weed it, you build a garden, which means you hire someone to make it for you because the scholar officials wouldn't be caught dead on their knees with a trowel. That I can assure you as well. So this whole phenomenon of the classic gardens of Suzhou, for example, is built on a class society where there are wealthy people, mostly retired scholar officials, who are enlarging and decorating their houses, much like today we improve our kitchens and bathrooms. I wanna show you one particular garden in Suzhou, and I'm gonna use it as a kind of vocabulary exercise and design exercise. This is a garden called the Humble Officials Garden. Nikki, is there any way to get rid of these bands across the screen? Let's not, let's not go there, okay. The Humble Officials Garden is the easiest English translation for this garden. In Chinese, it's the Zhuo Zheng Yuan, Zhuo Zheng Yuan. And this word Zhuo Zheng is a little hard to translate. Humble official is okay, that's all right. But there are a lot of connotations to the name and it's worth talking about that just a little bit. This is a plan of the garden, which is over uh, 12 acres in extent, three parts, extensive water features, and the house isn't even shown here. The house is the area to the south. It's just white on my diagram. Zhuo Zheng Yuan, what does that really mean? Well, this garden was built in 16th century Suzhou, that's the 1500s, by a man named Wang Xianchen, who was a retired official who got in trouble, uh, but had wealth. And Zhuo, Zhuo can be used in several ways in Chinese. It can be used to mean humble, if I'm a calligrapher and I want to sign off on a piece of handwriting I just wrote and I'm very proud of, you don't say proudly written by Bob Thorpe, you say humbly written by Bob Thorpe, right? Jaw one. So it can mean humble, but it also means in a sense unsuccessful. The failed politician's garden, the person who was in the stream to be a high ranking official but didn't make the final cut, for whatever reason, retired or was forced out and had to go back to retirement. And although retirement is a good thing, we all know that, don't we? Uh, it means you're not successful. If you're a retired official of a certain age, up until a certain age, then you're a failure. So this is just as well be called the failed one-time officials garden, not just the humble officials garden. Zhuo Zheng, Zheng here is for government and official government. And it's in the city of Suzhou. How many people here have been to China? Yay. And how many of you have been to Suzhou? Looks like three or four. Well, the next time you go to China, make sure you go to Suzhou because as master gardeners, you have to go to Suzhou. Suzhou is home to more gardens, per capita perhaps, historically important gardens that is, than any other place in China. Yangzhou is good, Nanjing is good, Hangzhou is good, there are even some in Beijing and Shanghai. But Suzhou is the garden city of China, and UNESCO has recognized the gardens of Suzhou, designating nine of them as a collective UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is the number one garden in that cluster of nine. Um, you can read about it on Dr. Google if you want to, and WikiLeaks and so forth. So it's a garden that was built initially in the 1500s. The garden we see today has gone through a lot of vicissitudes. And this is a general word of warning to anybody who talks about gardens in China and in Japan. They don't stay the same. They are constantly changing. And it's not just that the plantings change over time as they must. It's also that there are major redesigns of properties as properties change hands and as things happen. So for example, this garden was mostly burned in the 19th century during the Taiping Rebellion. It's definitely not today what it was before that destruction. And what, there are other examples. We could do the same thing with gardens in Kyoto, which were burned during the Great War and don't look now like they must have looked before that. So gardens are notoriously hard to track historically in terms of their features. But here, here is a kind of vocabulary, a designed vocabulary for the classic Chinese Suzhou scholars literati garden. How's that? First of all, it's an enclosed space. It will always be inside 
large, prominent, usually very straight line walls that define the property. And this is all private property. These are not public spaces, they never were. These are private residences, which include a space made into a garden, as well as the family residence. They were never public. So they were cut off from the street by a wall, like you see on the right-hand screen. And of course, people in the neighborhood knew very well there was a garden behind that wall, and sometimes they could even peek in. But basically, it was off limits to the rest of the world. It was a private space, enclosed. And the wall in South China is invariably going to be whitewashed white, and the tile roof is invariably going to be a gray, a high-fired uh, ceramic tile. The entrance to the garden is a very important point, and it will often carry the name of the garden in Chinese characters across the, the top of the door, as you see here with the Zhuo Zheng Yuan, that's actually carved brick. And so the name Zhuo Zheng Yuan is in relief in that carved brick over the doorway. And of course, the door is closed, as it almost always was. How would you get admittance to a garden in pre-modern times? Short answer is you wouldn't. You had to be someone who was close to the family, especially the master of the house. Could be a relative, could be an official or business associate, but even then it wasn't guaranteed you'd get into the garden per se. It's a private space. The garden was available, however, to everybody inside the household, and especially the women of the household and the children of the household, because by and large, the women didn't leave the household. They were basically cloistered in pre-modern times in China. So some kind of a dedicated formal entrance, usually closed, and a wall encircling the perimeter, usually following the property lines. In a place like Suzhou, that could be on a street like you see here, it could also be on a canal. There could be water just outside the wall. Then there are a series of pathways and galleries that lead you through the property and through the garden. And this is one of the key features of garden design or landscape design. You are led by the nose through the garden. You don't wander freely. You don't get off the path and go through the, the monkey grass and go look at the flowers in the far bed. You follow the path established for you by the designer in terms of a paved walkway and in terms of a sheltered walkway, like a gallery or a corridor you see on the right-hand screen. Your experience of the garden is predetermined by the designer. It's a given. It's a ready-made. It's all been thought out before you ever arrive. And you experience it, you experience it as he, she, they wanted you to experience it. In the case of South China, Suzhou, covered areas are rather important because it rains a lot. And of course, the summer sun is horrendous as well. The pathways are themselves a feature of interest. And there are whole chapters on how to make pathways in garden design books both pre-modern and uh, contemporary. Here are two uh, details of pebbles and broken tile used to make the pavement. So the garden has a paved pathway through it that leads you by the nose. It means that when you're walking around on your uh, two, on two feet and in your cloth shoes, you don't get wet, and you don't get muddy most of the time. Windows. Windows are constantly interrupting the walls as you make your way into and through and around the garden. You can have a corridor defined by a solid wall on one side and a couple of windows on the other. And those windows will typically be covered or crossed at least by tile, carved tile. Um, you can see a variety of designs here, all carved ceramic tile, an abstract floral design, a, a pot with a flower on the right-hand screen, carved bamboo in three dimensions in a window in the center in a white wall, and a, a lattice pattern. I think that's called broken ice in some books that you can see on the left. So every time there's a window, you're invited to look. And you're invited to look through at a predetermined target or object. There will be something through that window that you're supposed to look at. You're supposed to see the rock formation or the bamboo or the banana tree or whatever it might be. And of course, sometimes those can change with the seasons as well. Rocks. A garden is not complete without rocks and water and plantings and architecture. Four components to a Chinese garden are absolutely essential. Rocks and water, plantings and architecture. So you can tell the gardening part is only a part of the landscape architecture of Chinese gardens. <clears throat> 
Now the rocks come from a place called Lake Tai. Karen, would you hand me my sack, please? Lake Tai, the Great Lake, that's what the name means, is a huge freshwater lake just to the west of Suzhou. And it's over beds of limestone and it produces rocks just like this. This is very like a Lake Tai rock, but it comes from the Missouri Ozarks and it sits on my desk. Early on, Chinese scholars, at least from the Middle Ages, say the seventh, eighth centuries, were fascinated by these rocks that came out of the water with all kinds of holes and crevices and other kinds of interesting formations where they could imagine that there were caverns where the immortals hung out, for example. And so the idea of harvesting rocks from Lake Tai, they're called Tai Hu Shur, Tai Hu rocks, uh, developed in the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries. The most famous emperor of the Song Dynasty, a guy who we call Hui Zong, had a mania for Tai Hu rocks. He collected so many in his capital in Hunan province uh, that it took over a whole quarter of the city. The rocks were so big that the uh, people who were bringing them to the capital on barges had to tear down bridges over the canal so the rocks could get through for the emperor to make his rockeries out of Tai Hu rocks. And of course, I've already shown you Tai Hu rocks in a couple of snapshots of the Forbidden City uh, Garden already. So the placement of a rock, as you see on the left, can be a very important part of one section of the garden. And you can be assured it will be placed the way a curator would place a wonderful piece of sculpture or a fabulous vase or something else in three dimensions in a display gallery. So you can see it at its best and perhaps in different kinds of light or times of day. I'm showing you an example of that on the top of the screen on the right. This is actually from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. If you've been to the Met any time in the last 30, 40 years, you've experienced a replica of part of a Chinese garden from Suzhou called the Garden of the Master of the Fishing Nets, and they have Tai Hu rocks. As with so many things in China, uh, the natural supply of Tai Hu rocks wasn't adequate, so they made their own. And there are stories about people carving the limestone, putting it down in the lake to weather, and then pulling it out and selling it as an authentic Tai Hu rock. Water is extremely important. I, I said already the definition of landscape was shan shui, shan for mountains, shui for water. Mountains and water is landscape, literally in the concept of Chinese people. Water, whether you call it a chur or a tong, a tank or a pond, is essential for any ambitious garden. That already tells you something very important. The people who had these gardens built, again, they didn't build them themselves, had to have people in their service who were in some sense engineers, hydraulic engineers, who could bring water to the family property and who had the legal ability to corner that much water in their neighborhood and keep it for themselves before it flowed back out to the canal and went on to the Yangtze River, for example. So having a huge garden of 10, 12 acres, which is the case with the humble garden, where water is a significant fraction, tells you right away, the person who built this garden in the first place was an extremely well-to-do and probably well-connected person. Even more so in the case of the Beijing gardens where water is much more valuable. And then last but not least, pavilions, architecture. Every garden has to have its vantage points. There could be vantage points on the walkway or the pathway as you come in or go around the margins. There could be vantage points that are set up by how you come around a corner and see something like a Tai Hu rock. There can be vantage points when you arrive at the edge of water. But to really establish the most important vantage points, you build a small pavilion, a little tingzi, like on the left, or a, a, a xie a pavilion like you see on the right. Notice there are people hanging out in those gardens, in those pavilions uh, that I took the picture of. This is supposed to be a place where you can enjoy the view of for example, the lotuses in the pond right next door, or the autumn moon on the festival of the autumn moon, or the sunrise sunset, or some other distant view. So they are specifically meant to be places to sit and relax. If you have a servant who is attending you, you can have your tea at that point. Uh, if you're 
the owner of the garden, if you're the master of the garden, you can go out there and set up your table and practice calligraphy or painting or write poetry and entertain your guest if you have one. So these pavilions and, and, and such like are an integral part of the garden design. Much more important, in fact, than a lot of other things I've already talked about. It was a, a great tradition among Chinese scholars to name their pavilions for a feature that was especially well suited. So for example, the viewing the moon in the seventh month pavilion or whatever. Now that's a rapid look at the vocabulary of the classical gardens of Ming and Qing Japan, especially the Ming dynasty. So we're talking about gardens that took shape as a style of gardening in the next to last dynasty, the last Chinese dynasty, the Ming, in the 15th and 16th and 17th centuries, especially in South China, in Jiangnan, in cities like Suzhou and Yangzhou. Now the tradition of gardens in Japan has a little bit different trajectory and historical sources, and I wanna switch gears and talk about that. As many of you know, my partner, Karen Brock, was a professor of Japanese art. And so I now have to be extra careful as to what I say, because if I say anything that's wrong, uh, she'll be up here at my neck right away. Actually not, she's taught me all I know about Japan. So we're gonna focus on the city of Kyoto, K-Y-O-T-O, not Kyoto, but Kyoto, which is the old imperial capital. Kyoto was the imperial capital of Japan for most of Japanese history whether or not the real seat of power was there. It's a modern city with all the pros and cons of the modern city, but it's also an ancient city. And it really wears that mantle with great grace and elegance, shall I say. It's absolutely my favorite place in the world, or none. Uh, we're gonna be looking at temples in Kyoto that are emblematic of that Japanese gardening or garden tradition. Some of them were built as residences. Some of them were built as temples. I show you a residence on the left, now a garden, the Shisendo, and a temple on the right, the so-called Moss Temple, in a, in a diagram that they give you when you buy your admission ticket. So the tradition of gardening in Japan, all of my evidence is really gonna come from Kyoto with just a few exceptions. Now, as with Taoism in China, which embraces a variety of ideas about the human species in relation to the wider natural world, there is a tradition in Japan we call Shinto, Shinto, sometimes translated as the way of the gods, which is not very helpful. Uh, but the ideas that are embodied in Shinto are very diverse, very deep in Japanese culture. Some of them have roots on the continent or the peninsula of Korea, but they are ancient ideas about the nature of the universe and of human beings in relation to the universe. And then all kinds of things are piled on top of that, including a mythology and ultimately even a kind of distorted cult of the emperor by the time of the Second World War. I'm showing you a rock circle, a place called Oyu on the right-hand screen. This is a Paleolithic site, an old Stone Age site where people gathered stones and made these circles of rock out of some kind of appreciation for what that might represent to them what it might say about them in the world. The appreciation of rocks is as old as anything I can tell you about in Japan. Uh, and with a lot of different associations and resonances and echoes. Likewise, I'm showing you one of the oldest shrines in Japan, the Izumo Shrine in far Western Japan, uh, not in Kyoto. Um, and shrine architecture is an idea that probably comes from the continent, but the Japanese had their own way of rendering that architecture and it survives down to historic times. There are echoes of shrine architecture and the design of shrines in Japanese gardens as well. But Shinto is far too complicated a topic to deal with in a couple of sentences. Like Taoism, it could be a whole semester. The oldest historical garden that I know of in Japan goes back to the sixth and seventh centuries, probably seventh century, at a site just north of Nara called Heijo. And it's known as the Eastern Garden. Eastern Garden. And as with the Cantonese garden I showed you a minute ago, here's an artist's rendering of the excavated site because the capital at Heijo, the capital at Nara from the seventh century has been excavated. And we have the physical traces of, for example, the stones and the rocky beach you see in the foreground of that drawing. But again, it's really hard to recreate a true garden experience just from the footprint of things that survive 
and uh, appear then in an archaeological excavation. But we know that there were gardens being made in Japan at least by the time of the Heijo capital, say the seventh century of the common era. And we know that some of the ideas about how to make those gardens came from the continent, specifically from Tang, China. Notice how careful I'm being with my terms. Um, and as with China, imperial gardens are a feature of Japanese garden history. There is an imperial palace in Kyoto called the Gosho. It's open today. You have to buy a ticket and make an arrangement. But unlike a Chinese imperial palace, the Gosho, as you see here in my diagram, is anything but a very regular courtyard plan. The Forbidden City is the ultimate courtyard plan with a bilateral axis and a rectangular shape and everything on and off the axis uh, bilaterally symmetrical. The Japanese Imperial Palace is anything but that. It's much more uh, loose and, and free flowing in terms of its spaces. The real inspiration for gardens in Japan, however, isn't the Imperial Garden, what was happening inside the Imperial Palace. The real inspiration in Japan were Buddhist temples. Here are two pictures, a little more informative, I think, of the Japanese Imperial Palace in Kyoto called the Gosho. The outer court on the left and the garden that's part of the back uh, 40 acres. Another thing we have to keep in mind when we talk about the gardens of Japan is what I call literary botany. Literary botany. In other words, the associations to literature through plants. There are a number of plants, some native to Japan, some from the continent that figure prominently in Japanese literature as symbols of emotions or seasons or key moments in a narrative or things of that sort. And so iris, for example, which you see here, are a very common motif in Japanese decorative arts, but also they're a motif in Japanese literature and poetry. And so the symbolism or the associations, the resonances of the iris for any informed viewer are a part of the garden experience. If you're walking through a garden and you see a plot of iris like the one on the right-hand screen, you may well think of the most famous poem about the iris in this season or that, that month or what have you. So there is a kind of literary allusion to many of the plants which feature in Japanese gardens, more so than specificity, with more specificity than would be the case in China, for example. There's also what I call seasonal manias. There's a great love of certain things that happen on the natural calendar in Japan, not least cherry blossoms. I'm showing you here a, a map on the left-hand screen which plots the progress from south to north of the arrival of the cherry blossoms in Japan. And these dates, say the 30th of March for Southern Honshu, or the 10th of April for Kyoto, or maybe the, the 20th of, of April for someplace further north, these are practically national holidays in Japan and have been regarded with great enthusiasm for as long as we know. Uh, when the cherry blossoms arrive, that's a great day. And so planting with that in mind is a part of the design and appreciation of Japanese gardens. And I said already, a major source of inspiration for gardens in Japan is Buddhist temples. There are lots of different kinds of Buddhist temples and different uh, streams within Buddhism in Japan, but one of the most important is Pure Land, Pure Land or Jodo Buddhism. Most of the famous example of such a temple uh, belonging to that kind of Buddhism is the Byodo In, Byodo In, which is outside of Kyoto in the southeastern suburbs. There's a plan on the left and a view of the re restored buildings on the right. This is a medieval structure, by the way, that was restored a few years ago. Not to my liking, I have to say, it looks like it's brand new. But the key element in a Pure Land temple was the garden that evokes the Pure Land, a garden setting with a big pond that evokes the Pure Land. What was the Pure Land? The Pure Land is a concept in ancient Indian and Central Asian Buddhism that migrated to China, Korea, and Japan and took over Buddhism in the Middle Ages in those several countries. The Pure Land is a place where you and I can be reborn and live a kind of blissful life if we have faith in the Buddha of eternal life and eternal light, Amitayus, Amitabha, Amida, those are the different names for the Buddha. This is a kind of um, cult that grows up in ancient India and Central Asia, 
has affinities with some other belief systems you may have heard about, and goes to East Asia and becomes tremendously important. It's a belief based on faith. If you die chanting the name of Amida, you could possibly be reborn in that Western Pure Land. And the Western Pure Land is absolutely flat, unlike Japan, no mountains. The water of the streams and, and rivers and, and what have you of the Pure Land is always the right temperature. So when you step in, it feels just right. When you step in the water to bathe yourself, the water rises to the appropriate height so you can suds and cleanse yourself with ease. The trees are fragrant. They have jewels and tinkling of bells, and there's a fragrance of perfume in the air. This is the Pure Land. This is life in the Pure Land. And so to evoke that vision of paradise, and that's really what it is, a kind of paradise, but a Buddhist one, not a Taoist one, People in China and Korea and Japan created temples where the main hall would look onto a pond and have a kind of garden-like or park-like surrounding that evoked the Pure Land. Now I want to take you on a brief tour, very brief tour, of two of the Kyoto Gardens uh, that really give you a vocabulary for understanding the style and the preferences of this kind of design in Japan, as opposed to what we saw in Suzhou a little bit. The first one was the Garden of a Shogun. And since everybody in, in America is crazy about shoguns, I'll give you his portrait. This is Ashikaga Yoshimasa. Yoshimasa is his personal name. Ashikaga is the family name. He was the eighth shogun, and he lived, as you can see, in the 15th century. He died in 1490. The first garden we're going to look at was his. It's called the Silver Pavilion in English, the Gin Kakuji. It's in northeastern Kyoto. And if you only have a day in Kyoto between flights or something of the sort, make sure to go to the Silver Pavilion and the second garden I'm going to show you as well. It is today a rather large, sprawling complex. Uh, the gift shop and the toilets are not original to the site, but, but the garden does preserve most of its features from the late 15th century, which is remarkable. You enter by a well-tended path. That's on the left-hand screen. So it's a paved path with some areas of gravel on one side and plantings floating there. Other areas of lawn, as you and I might think of them, but really it's just clipped, uh, low-lying vegetation. Careful plantings of trees. You're led down that path to an entryway, and then you turn to your right, and you have a view of the so-called silver pavilion. I say so-called because it isn't silver at all. It's dark wood that's aged over centuries with a gray tile roof. There is another temple in Kyoto in the northwest suburbs by a relative of this same person that's called the Golden Pavilion. And that truly was covered by gold leaf and is today, as a matter of fact. This is in effect an imitation of that garden. And to some people, the intention was to cover it with silver. According to other people, it's simply a matter of not being quite as good as gold and so forth and so on. In any case, this is a two-story building on the edge of the garden, on the edge of the water, which was meant as a room for worship by the retired shogun, Yoshimasa, where he could look at the garden as he worshipped at the altar. And also an elevated uh, chamber at the top, the second floor, where there were images of Kanon, the Kanon Guanyin, uh, of Avalokiteshvara, the great Bodhisattva. So at the Silver Pavilion, you see, just as soon as you get in the door and turn to the right, the name, the object for which the garden is named. It's perhaps more famous now, however, for having the most amazing sand garden of any I know of in Kyoto, at least of the pre-modern gardens. Nowadays, there are a lot of strange things going on with sand gardens. This is probably an attempt to create an effect when there's a full moon. Think of the garden in a pre-modern city with no lighting to speak of in the neighborhood. Think of the full moon coming out and think of it casting shadows onto the surface of the carefully raked and tended white gravel. Think about that as an experience to watch shadows and otherwise experience the evening moonlight. As it is today, and that's really what we have to say, as it is today, it's a combination of a flat field that could be interpreted a bunch of different ways. Perhaps it's a seashore, perhaps it's planted fields, perhaps it's just stripes, and also a kind of truncated cone uh, 
How they keep all the sand in that cone shape, I don't quite know, but they do. There are other halls built in the garden, just like in China. The Togudo there on the left-hand screen is another worship hall that also affords a view of the watery garden. And then of course there are, there's a major pond that occupies the center of the space. And you can walk all the way around the pond. Now in Japan, we're accustomed to talking about two kinds of gardens as if they were exclusive, and they really aren't. We talk about viewing gardens and strolling gardens. Gardens to be viewed from a single point inside, gardens to be viewed by strolling around the precinct. But in fact, this garden offers both. If you were privileged to be in one of those buildings, you had a view garden. And otherwise, if you were walking around in the paths, you had a strolling garden. There are, to be sure, later on gardens that are really meant primarily for strolling, not so much for views. Now, the second garden I'm going to give you the fastest tour possible of is a place called the Rio Anji, Rio Anji, uh, also in Kyoto. This is actually in the northwest suburbs. Again, if you have that one day between flights, this is the other place you have to go. Um, it was once a very large temple complex, but what we're concerned about is one precinct off of the abbot's quarters. So it's just one small part of the temple that has this name. Uh, you would go into the abbot's quarters through this entrance. This is a late building. We know this garden was burned and destroyed more than once. We know that after one of the fires, all the wreckage of the building was thrown onto the garden area proper. Uh, but we do have some early records of it. It could go back to the same period as the civil pavilion. In any case, it's been around for a long time. The abbot's quarters are called in uh, Japanese hojo, hojo. See the characters on my slide and also there on a placard over the uh, central bay of the room itself on the left-hand screen, Hojo. And that's a view of the interior. Notice that the interior is completely furnished with only tatami mats. It has painted screens, which are a much later date than the garden itself, which can be opened and closed to change the spatial arrangement. And this is very much a, a, a the premise for a viewing garden. You would be in the Hojo inside the uh, Res the uh, residence of the abbot looking out on the garden. And this is the garden. If you had to pick one picture of a Japanese garden for PR purposes, you'd probably pick this one. This is a dry rock garden. This is a kind of distillation of the principles of making garden spaces uh, according to a certain aesthetic that values the austerity, but also the beauty of natural rocks and the moss that often goes with it. And that's about it. We don't really know when it became the custom to put rocks on display in a gravel field, but bear in mind that Shinto shrines typically have such an interior space with the gravel uh, surface covering surrounding all the major parts of the shrine building. In this case, it's something like 15 rocks that are displayed singly or in small clusters inside little islands that are covered with moss there are also some moss growing on the rocks, displayed from left to right, from one end to the other. It's a long rectangle, uh, but much, much smaller than anything we showed you in China. Enclosed by its own wall, which is a low wall, and that's important. It's a low wall so that things outside the wall and above the wall are in fact visible. And that wall itself is an ancient relic. It's gone through a lot of vicissitudes, and it forms the backdrop for your appreciation of the rocks in the field of gravel. The composition of the rocks, of course, could be talked about in great depth. In many ways, these are landscape compositions. This way of putting three rocks together is exactly what you might have read about in a Chinese manual on how to make landscape painting compositions. In any case, the aesthetic is much the same. Notice the rocks are all different from one another, but they also have certain things in common. Some of the rocks, by the way, carry inscriptions of the people who set them or placed them. Some people say that Japanese gardens are really the art of placing stones. And if that's how you want to think about it, this is maybe the best example right here. And as I said, the wall, which is an earthen wall under a, uh, a, a bark roof, uh, has its own interest in terms of the variations of the surface, which has been rubbed with oil and changed over time. So you have an effect sitting in the hojo, looking out, uh, under the, from under the eaves onto this big yard of gravel with its rocks against the earthen wall, 
a kind of perfect preordained landscape composition, which is completely open to your interpretation or appreciation as the viewer. Is it the mother tigress leaping across the sea with her cubs? Well, that's one word, one version of it. Is it the Isles of the Immortals? Is it something else entirely? It's up to you, of course. So what I've tried to show you is that there are a lot of things in common between the gardens of China and Japan, including history, but there are also distinctive directions in taste, in style, in the selection of material uh, that diverge between the two. I also want to remind you, uh, they both share the tradition of borrowed views. That's getting back again to that low wall. When the blossoms are in bloom, you can see them from the garden viewing Hojo as you look across and above that roof. This is an idea that's common both in China and in Japan. But I want to remind you at the very end that when you go, you will not be alone. <laughs> Even though I would take my tour at eight o'clock, eight o'clock sharp to get in there, you're never going to be alone. But that doesn't matter. You sit there, you can enjoy that garden. And I hope you've enjoyed these remarks as well. Nikki. Quick question off the chat. The rocks from the lake, remind me, were those from the shore or were they actually excavating them out of the water? Uh, traditionally, the question was, were the rocks from the lake from the shore or out of the water? The answer is they, my understanding is they mostly came from the bed of the lake. People went out in boats and retrieved them from the bottom of the lake. Yes. In the back. Yeah. The question was, were the Japanese monks' quarters gardens also originally private? The answer is yes and no. Uh, in principle, most people could go in and out of temples most of the time, but not to all parts of the temple. So the abbot's quarters typically would not be open to the general membership, shall we say, of the, of the temple. But if you had business with the abbot, or were somebody important to the temple, like a patron, then you'd have access to his quarters and therefore his garden. Are there comments? Yes, Larry. Well, I understand that <laughs> are there gardens in any kind of way um, similar to what we've seen? Well, there is a Japanese garden designed with Japanese principles of design, selection of materials at the zoo in Topeka, which you should know. Um, there's also a wonderful Japanese garden at the Missouri Botanical Garden in St. Louis. It's a major strolling garden, as a matter of fact. Yeah. In the back, yes. So we're being reminded that there's a festival at the Topeka Zoo for Asian American Pacific Islander community celebration, April 13th, May 13th, May 13th. Yes, Nancy. That's right. And so it is a very nice old pocket garden, and it is an authentic Japanese garden right downtown next to the museum. Right. So Nancy is reminding us of the pocket garden next to Watkins Museum, which is also in Japanese style. Well, thank you all. We'll do this again sometime.